Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. It's great to be here this afternoon with you. Uh, my name is Nuzhat Jafri. I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. And I will be begin the program with a recitation from the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm ad-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nas'in. Ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladhina anamta alayhim. Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim. This is uh, the opening surah of the Quran, and its translation is, In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Praise be to God, Lord of all the worlds, the most compassionate, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. It is you who we worship. It is you we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path the path of those on whom you bestowed your grace, not those who are the objects of anger, nor those who go astray. Now it gives me great pleasure to pass it on to our uh, national board member, Nassim Karani, who's also the president of the uh, Edmonton uh, chapter of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. And she will uh, now offer a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. I respectfully acknowledge that I'm situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. While we meet on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment of, to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm a commitment and responsibility in improving relations between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. We acknowledge the ancestral and the unceded territory of all the Inuits, Meti, and First Nations people that call this nation home, especially the indigenous peoples of Edmonton, Burlington, Sudbury, and Toronto, where today's speakers are based in, and also of Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of Algonquin, Anishinaabeg people, which plays host to the Global Center for Pluralism. We conduct this event with respect for this land that we are on today and for the people who have and do reside here. The acknowledgement recognizes individual, indigenous people's long standing presence in these territories and this recognition and respect for indigenous peoples and their lands is a key towards reconciliation. Thank you. I would now like to pass on this mic to Nina Karachi Kalad. She is the president of Canadian C Council of Muslim Women, the National. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. I'm Nina Karachi Khalid, the president of the National Board of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. On behalf of the National Board, our 17 CCMW chapters across Canada, our executive director, Nuzhat Jafri, and our amazing staff, I want to welcome you to this wonderful event to celebrate International Women's Day 2021 with our co presenters, the Aga Khan Museum and the Global Center for Pluralism. We at CCMW have found this year's theme for International Women's Day, Choose to Challenge, to be a fitting one. We were established 39 years ago by a group of women who challenged the status quo within the Muslim community and in our wider society. They sought to mobilize their passion for social justice and faith to enrich their communities and work towards the common good of Canadian society. The Canadian Council of Muslim Women is dedicated to the empowerment 
equality and equity of all Muslim women in Canada. Our mission is to affirm the identities of Canadian Muslim women and to promote their lived experiences through in community engagement, public policy, and amplified awareness of the social injustices that Muslim women and girls endure in Canada, while at the same time advocating for their diverse needs and equipping them with the necessary resources to maximize their efforts to improve the status of women. We are believing women and we hold tight to our Islamic heritage and our Canadian identity. The Aga Khan Museum has a podcast called This Being Human, they have a beautiful phrase where they say that they aim to highlight extraordinary stories and people from across the kaleidoscope of Muslim experience. Today's event to celebrate International Women's Day is going to do just that, highlight three amazing Muslim women and their kaleidoscope of talent. They're extraordinary and they're creating exceptional work in their communities across Canada. They're all friends of CCMW and Tammy Gaber and Nadia Kurd have both been awarded the CCMW Women Who Inspire Award in the past. Timaj Garad has performed at a few of our gatherings, both in person and virtually. We're so excited to share their work and passion with you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Meredith Preston McGee, the Secretary General of the Global Center for Pluralism. Meredith, over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Meredith Preston McGee, the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism. We are delighted to be co-presenting today's event with the Canadian Council for Muslim Women and the Aga Khan Museum. The Global Center for Pluralism, based in Ottawa, was jointly founded by His Highness the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada. We work with policy leaders, educators and community builders to amplify and implement the transformative power of pluralism. Diversity in society at every level is a demographic fact. Pluralism refers to the actions we take to respond positively to these differences, to see difference as a basis for a more successful and prosperous society and not something to be managed or overcome. We believe that societies thrive when differences are valued. Art is a particularly powerful medium to express differences in ways that enlighten and offer new windows on different perspectives. In this challenging time we are living through, the power of the arts can be profound in reconnecting us. Today's event, focused on the experiences of leading Muslim women in art and design, is one such important conversation as we look at how art builds bridges across difference, connects cultures and beliefs, and works ultimately towards pluralistic societies where everyone belongs. We were inspired to bring you today's dialogue in honour of International Women's Day, a global occasion not only to celebrate the achievements of women, but critically to raise awareness about the ongoing need for women's equality worldwide an issue that is an essential prerequisite for pluralism, and certainly a discussion we need to engage in every day, not only on March 8th each year. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ulrika Alchemis, the Interim Director and CEO of the Aga Khan Museum, and another inspiring woman leader among us. Ulrika, over to you. Thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you very much for um, allowing us to be co-presenters of this magnificent event today with the Global Center of Pluralism and the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. We are really excited to be coming together because we all share in an ethos of pluralism and and at the same time also contributing to um, better knowledge around the achievements of Muslim cultures in a globalized world. And of course, we are celebrating today in particular the contributions of Muslim women, which have always formed an integral part of the evolution of world cultures and world civilization, but as is so often the case, not only with them, but their sisters all over the globe, these contributions and achievements are often overlooked. And today we are extremely privileged to um, change that a little bit with presenting three magnificent contributors to our society here in Canada and indeed to our globalized world today. Day, three phenomenal thinkers in the areas of arts and culture and women that are role models 
in the way that they have combined their Muslimness with their dedicated and passionate Canadian identity today. Participating in this event, we have on the occasion of International Women's Day 2021, Dr. Dr. Tammy Geber, who is an Associate Professor of Architecture at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. We have Timaj Garad, a multidisciplinary storyteller, art educator and creative consultant, but most spectacularly a phenomenal spoken word artist. And Dr. Nadia Korat, curator at the University of Alberta Museum's art collection and a fascinating trailblazer in bringing dialogues through the arts and through culture between indigenous peoples and Muslim cultures to the foreground in the context of Canada. I look forward to celebrating this event with all of you. Thank you for having us. And now it's over to Nadia. I would like to start by thanking the CCMW, the Aga Khan Museum, and the Global Center for Pluralism for hosting and organizing this event today. It is an honor to be here. I'm coming to you from Edmonton, which is in Treaty 6, a longtime gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples and the traditional homelands of the Papa Chase and Métis Nation. And in the words of Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, I would also like to reiterate and say decolonization is not a metaphor, and that land acknowledgments must also be followed up with direct, tangible actions, ones that ultimately supports Indigenous sovereignty. This benefits us all. Well, where do I begin? Quite simply, I'm an art historian and a curator. I'm also someone who is a Muslim, but also a woman of color who comes from a working class immigrant family. My work has long focused on contemporary Islamic visual culture. In more recent years, I've been interested in the work of contemporary Indigenous artists and to learn and see how the ways in which they articulate and respond to issues related to land, language, colonial, and familial relations. While on the surface, this may seem like very separate areas of research, they are, however, connected by key concepts, such as the impact of unacknowledged histories, social justice, and storytelling, all within the Canadian settler colonial context. Something that Plains Creek curator Gerald McMaster once wrote has long resonated with me. In 2002, he provided a framework to re-examine art history and indeed by extension on how one should frame a curatorial practice. He wrote, and I quote, I would like to discuss not Aboriginal art history, but rather our interrelated history, which I argue is fundamental to Canadian identity. I want to consider a history between us that is older than Confederation, older than Cartier's landing, a history that may be a thousand years old. As well, I want to consider how Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people exchanged, struggled, and looked at each other, how we all contributed to this country. In the end, I believe there is a basis for developing such a historical perspective through visual art. In short, McMaster argues for an art history that, again, I quote, creates, cre is created through the historical analysis of interrelations and which he says will re result in a new discursive space. For me, this really means changing how we construct and understand history here in Canada. So it doesn't just start at Confederation or even with the group of seven, for example. I'm really interested in tying um, visual art to broader social and political issues. I would also add that this discursive space is not just about analyzing interrelations, but it's one that must also address and situate urgent issues of white supremacy, land restitution for Indigenous peoples, and climate change, amongst many other issues. For my presentation today, I would like to look at a few projects that I've organized or been involved with in the past few years and look at the ways in which they've articulated community, social justice and place 
but most of all engaged women and their stories to show the interrelated nature of our history. So one of my first, um, very first art jobs as a young art student was as a tour facilitator for the Prison Arts Foundation in 2001. Prison Arts, the Prison Arts Foundation was a not-for-profit arts organization that ran programming in Canadian correctional facilities. They would run annual visual arts competitions and winning entries would then go on to art tours to various correctional facilities across Canada. Alongside another colleague, I traveled to Atlantic Canada, Quebec and Ontario to various facilities with inmate art. And for over two and a half months, we visited close to 30 correctional facilities and we organized pop-up art shows in gymnasiums and halls of maximum, medium, minimum, youth and women facilities. What we saw on our journey was, of course, the immeasurable talent, but also the deep rooted flaws of the criminal justice system and the legacy, the legacy of the residential school system, as most facilities we visited were overwhelmingly Indigenous and Black. And at the time, I did not fully understand this and the magnitude of systemic racism. And indeed, it's taken me several years to unpack that. This experience left an indelible mark on me and made me think about not only who consumed art, but who is considered an artist and the different roles that exhibitions can have. And of course, it really shaped my understanding of justice in Canada. Fast track to 2006, and I was invited by SAVAC, the South Asian Visual Arts Collective in Toronto, to organize Mukarna's Intersections of Islamic Architecture. This was a two person exhibit and was hosted by the Niagara Artist Run Center in St. Catharines. And it featured the work of Egyptian Canadian architect Sharif Sunbell and the late Pakistani American painter Lubna Ava. Here, the goal was to really showcase the diversity of Muslim spaces and ritual practices and situate the exhibition outside of Toronto, in this case, St. Catharines to show the growing impact and nature of regional communities. Part of this exhibition was a wall where people could post images of their mosque in their community. And what I learned from this experience was that people in the Muslim community desire to be seen and to be reflected back in exhibitions in a respectful and collaborative way. So not in the traditional top-down uh, uh, dissemination of information, um, but rather the exchange of ideas was the, the primary um, result of this exhibition. And really it sort of helped informed again, my, my desire to work within communities um, uh, within Canada. In 2010, I had started to work at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery, which was and still is the only public art gallery in Northwestern Ontario. The gallery has a long history of collecting Indigenous art from across Canada, as well as the art of Northwestern Ontario. And indeed, the gallery had a long history with Michif artist Christy Belcourt who instigated walking, the Walking With Our Sisters um, project and brought the commemoration to Thunder Bay in 2014. Walking With Our Sisters featured over 2,000 handmade moccasin tops, also known as vamps or uppers, which were made by over 1,300 individuals. In its layout, the commemoration also included a sacred bundle which contained several spiritual and ceremonial items, such as three eagle staffs, a pipe, a buffalo skull, and a drum. Symbolizing the unfinished lives of women, the moccasin vamps were organized in a circular pathway and laid upon the gallery floor, which was also covered by red fabric and a rose of cedar boughs. In the course of three weeks, the gallery was transformed into a sacred lodge where over 4,000 visitors were greeted, smudged, and led through the commemoration by a handful of volunteers and elders who with them walked with the sisters and honored their lives. 
I was a part of the organizing committee in Thunder Bay and participated in a number of ceremonial activities as well as public outreach initiatives. But it was really the volunteers and keepers of the com commemoration who kept the, ex the commemoration going, rather, um, as they came together and also made a deputation to the city council in Thunder Bay that same year. Again, this commemoration was grounded in regional ceremonies and emphasized that we all work together collaboratively and really followed the local protocol set out by elders. So from Walking With Our Sisters grew another exhibition um, called Teaching Is In The Making. And this work, this exhibition featured the work of Anishinaabe Kwe artists Liana Marshall and Celeste Pedri Spade. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the jingle dresses, or rather story dresses, made by Liana Marshall. Part of her Zagdawin, or Love, project, um, which is a part of the Seven Grandfathers teachings, Liana's dresses really pay homage to her family. The first dress she designed and stitched called Say a Prayer to the Moon, reaccounts her mother's experience of abuse at Poplar Hill Indian Residential School in Northwestern Ontario, and how alone at night, lying in her bed, she looked up and saw the bright full moon and prayed to it so that her father may come and take her home. Made from black velvet, the dark cloth, cloth represented the darkness of the night whereas the yellow, large yellow beaded circle radiated light alongside the silver jingles that cover the dress. In making the piece, Marshall also enlisted the help of her twin sister, Jean Marshall, to bead the circle. And this collaborative process connected their fam familial relations within the concept of Zagdalen, but also embodied their shared stories that have shaped their families. Coming out of Walking With Our Sisters, another um, exhibition was um, uh, came out of the, the, the collaboration there. Um, and this was Uprising, a mid-career of uh, Michif artist Christy Balcourt's work, alongside the work of traditional Anishinaabe teacher Isaac Murdoch. This exhibition traveled across Canada to various um, uh, institutions and uh, across the country and really um, examined her, the artist's work from the last 15 years, um, which was the large main focus of large uh, scale canvas paintings that draws inspiration from the floral beadwork designs of Michif women from the early 1800s. Belcourt describes her painting process as one that has now developed where entire floral patterns are created by a series of dots that are created by dipping the end of a paintbrush or knitting needle into paint and pressing it onto the canvas. And here we see the publication co-produced by the Thunder Bay Art Gallery and the Carleton University um, Art Gallery here is the installation view at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina. So more recently, I've been working um, with the Edmonton City as a museum project to tell the story of Hilary Hamden and the Ladies Muslim Society. Over the past few months, I've been interviewing second and third generation uh, people involved with the Al Rashid Mosque, specifically specifically the Ladies Muslim Society, about their experiences living in Edmonton and in Fort Chippewan. This story, as well as a number of archival images, will be available on the eCamp website and really gives you a sense of the civic, um, uh, the civic role that this group had played in, this, uh, in the city of Edmonton during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And just to sort of end my presentation, I wanted to also mention the Print Study Center at the University of Alberta, where I currently um, spend a lot of my time, particularly pre-COVID. The Print Study Center is a teaching facility that houses over 3,500 works on paper. 
and is the key site for object-based learning, a mode of education that involves the use of objects in the learning environment. Students, faculty, visiting scholars and staff, as well as the larger Edmonton community can make visits or visit online to see original works of art. And this, um, the Print Study Center is a real important place of scholarship and really sort of fostering um, uh, the te active teaching and learning about print study and the culture of print uh, and works on paper at the University of Alberta. The collection at the Print Study Center is truly global. However, in the past two years, we've been making strides to expand our collection to integrate and to um, involve more women artists and Indigenous women artists from Alberta and Indigenous artists um, from the region as well. Pre-pandemic, we would welcome hundreds of visitors. However, we've shifted most of this work online. And of course, the Print Study Center plays a, a big part in our online initiatives. To end, I hope this presentation has provided you with a broad look at my past and current curatorial work, but most importantly showcased how art and art exhibits can happen in a variety of places and have deep connections to the places we live and the communities that we are involved with. And it can very much happen outside of traditional museum or gallery spaces. And on that note, I would like to turn it over and say thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, Nadia. That was absolutely fascinating. And I can already uh, think of some questions I will want to ask you later on. But uh, may I ask now to, uh, for the next speaker to step up to our virtual podium and uh, present. Yes, hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum. Um, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation, Nadia. I'm just blown away and I just love all the images you shared as well. Um, so my name is Tamaj. I'm a um, poet, singer, songwriter, arts educator. And I wanted to start by just sharing um, a song with you. It's called Black Gold. It's my first single off my EP, which is also now released and out into the world. Um, and the EP is called Blooming at the Mouth. So I wanna share this piece without any kind of preamble. <laughs> um, and I will, I will kind of unpack it later because it's a really important piece. But just to give you all a little bit of the context of the piece, it is a poem that I wrote a couple of years ago as an ode to Black Muslim women. It's a, a love letter to Black Muslim women. Um, I'm an uh, Ethiopian Harari, Black Muslim woman, and um, I think that this, this piece is something that is just really important as, a, as an anthem for us and as a celebratory piece um, to kind of, you know, pay homage and, and also um, really bring light to some of the some of the things that we navigate in the intersections of being Black, Muslim, and woman. So I hope you enjoy this piece called Black Gold. Black Muslim girls with the brilliance of many suns and the wisdom of many moons where every phase is a better you. Look at the divine at where we deny our worth. Prayer be woven fingers where we are triggered. Proceed to whisper scripture and strive higher than the brand of justice that was promised here, here in the in-between, here in the you can't hear yourself loud enough to hear your dreams. I know this system makes you nervous sometimes, but your nervous system was designed to feed you feeling. Impulse through your pulse for healing. Your winter's withering in your bloom while holding on to your their truths. Your blackness has always been in season. Fire in your soul, you hold not when they know. Shine in like gold that grow in over the coast. Black Muslim girls, you are more than magic. You are powerful. They can't even imagine you are black gold, black gold. Black gold. Black gold, black gold, black gold. 
You are more than magic. You are a multitude of dope fly out of this world. Love making love to love melanated masterpiece. There is nothing tragic about you. The tragedy is living in the kind of world that brings you the kind of grief that has you digging the earth with your teeth. Duality wrapped in your tongue as you coat switch deep enough to be black and Muslim, but rarely at the same time. Your spine is the site of intergenerational trauma and they mine your back until it cracks and exposes the black hole from your backbone that was sought, but this is not a minery. We are the kind of tired you become when you're both the product and the labor because apparently there's a bed here on our backs that some will sleep on yet call themselves woke. song black gold um off the upcoming ep blooming at the mouth and um i wrote that song like i said as a love letter it was first a poem it's kind of had this interesting evolution from being a poem to then you know becoming music i ended up writing a hook and and all of that and um working with a producer to create an entire ep um out of just like the concept um of, of blooming which is really kind of coming into um my own truth speaking power to truth. Um, the bloom, especially at the mouth, is, is really about kind of lifting silences. And I wanted to release Black Gold as my first single because I think that for a long time, not I think, I know for a long time, um, being Black and Muslim and woman, you know, that was that kind of identity intersection where it was super difficult to navigate, but no one was really talking about it unless they were a Black Muslim woman, and even just the intersection of being Black and Muslim. Um, we experience so much erasure in our community, both in sort of the presence within the community, um, the ways that, you know, we are not necessarily invited to or, or take up space or acknowledged in space in the same ways, but also in terms of stories. I think stories are really, really important um, in terms of being able to also see yourself not just in the present, but also in the future. And I think something that's happened, and this is kind of something that you can extend to really any community that's been silenced or erased from history is when your history is, is not told, when your stories are not told in the present day, you have a hard time sort of imagining yourself in the future. Um, so I wanted to actually frame this conversation around a few things around joy, first of all, around play, which are, you know, interconnected concepts and around possibility or, or around the ability to reimagine ourselves in the future, to imagine ourselves in the future, which I think is a really critical aspect of the work that I do as an artist, especially as an artist who takes up physical space as a performance artist, because for me, taking up space where I've been denied space is something that is an act of resistance, but it's also an act of resilience. And I think that for our communities to not see ourselves in space um, is something that has become a, a trauma that we really can only start to heal from by creating spaces to exist in. And instead of instead of asking for that to, to happen or you know waiting for the world to change, I'm a strong proponent of, you know building capacity for yourself and your community and creating those spaces, those alternative spaces, those third spaces, whether it's in a song, whether it's in a physical space, whether it's within friendships and relationships, but creating those spaces where we can start to, to first heal and then start to be able to actually take back our stories and reimagine ourselves um, back in physical space, back to the future, so to speak, right? Um, back in in present day as well and and learn how to kind of to kind of sit with our acknowledging ourselves and our communities as possible um so i want to explore a little bit of what that means and what it means in the song black gold is really kind of understanding like yes anti-black islamophobic racism exists 
um, we can talk about that, we can deconstruct that. And, and I think I've done that in the song, but I think the, what I love about the song even more, and I wish I could have shown you the video as well because, um, and I encourage you to watch it. It's just Black Gold Timaj, T-I-M-A-J. Garad, G-A-R-A-D, and you can watch the video on YouTube. Um, and what the video really shows is the, the depiction of joy. So I'm talking about some heavy things, you know, I'm talking about um, labor, being the product and the labor. I'm talking about um, feeling silenced in community, feeling like we can't be Black and Muslim at the same time, like there's a conflict with those two identities. But I'm also talking about joy. I'm talking, I'm saying, you know, you're the brilliance of many suns and the wisdom of many moons. So tempering those two things, acknowledging that those two things can exist and acknowledging that, you know, having the capacity to also understand that our lives don't, don't begin and end at those, um, at those identities in a, in a sense that we can start to, while we're deconstructing, also reconstruct community, reconstruct um, who we could be. Um, and, and I really think that that is something that's a really powerful act of resistance to also dis display that joy um, and really kind of recreate that through the art, but also through just your daily interactions and community. And I think that um, really celebrating joy, acknowledging joy, um, joy as well as play is an act, a powerful act of reimagining possibility. Um, and, it starts with healing. I think we often don't talk about joy and play when it comes to healing. And when I talk about when I talk about play, it's really about doing something for the sake of it. You know, so in the video, you'll see me just like jumping, jumping rope, like just hanging out, drinking coffee with friends, you know, doing the kind of day to day things that perhaps are mundane, um, perhaps are like, well, why are you doing that? You know, what, what's the purpose of that? Well, there is no purpose, just like how I can create art that also doesn't talk about any of these things, that also is not about Black Muslim women and is not about resisting anything. And I do have a couple of pieces like that on the album, but I think it's important to actually, to ask ourselves, like, what does it mean to really just exist in an expression of ourselves that is removed from trauma? Um, not to say that we don't do the work of looking at trauma, of healing it. And if you're in a, and, and I'm speaking specifically to people that are experiencing that trauma too. I'm not talking here about, about allies. Obviously you should do the work and you should, <laughs> you should act, but I'm talking about when you're experiencing that. A lot of the times we are asked to perform our trauma. And this piece, the reason why it's so important to me is because it's sort of a sort of kind of dances between th those lines, right? It's, it's an expression of unapologetic Black Muslim girl joy. Literally just wrote it for Black Muslim women and I love that other people love it, but I don't care if they do, you know? <laughs> um, and I think that there's power in that. Um, even though it's talking about the heavy things, like we can have that space to have heavy conversations, um, but also understand that there can be undertones of, of hope. And I really kind of, draw from prophetic wisdom when I think about undertones of hope that um, as Muslims, we are a people of, of hope. We are a people of understanding the mercy of God, understanding that our being is not, although we're situated here currently, we are not um, necessarily of here. You know, we could be here and not be of here. And I think that, you know, that is really about knowing our inherent worth as, as human beings. Um, so when we talk about joy, it can, if, if it doesn't come from a place of experiencing genuine joy in this world, I really try to, to take that from a place of knowing that there is an inherent worth and an inherent value regardless of what's happening around us. So I try to draw from those strengths in terms of the way that I process and the way that I create my art so that there are undertones of hope um, because you know, they're, they're, that's the realm of possibility. And what I love so much about futurism, um, I wouldn't necessarily describe myself as an Afrofuturist artist or futurist artist. However, there are a lot of themes of that in my work, um, especially in some work that I plan on releasing in the future, my, my latest work. And the reason for that is because creating possibility and imagining is something that I think allows us to curate our own 
our own futures. And of course, the future is never guaranteed. But what does it mean to really imagine? Like to ask ourselves that question is critical. You know, history um, repeats itself sometimes because we, you know, we don't know it enough. Um, but oftentimes it's because we don't want to imagine a, a world that's different. And that can be because we benefit from the status quo. It can be because we come from a place of privilege and we actually don't care to change <laughs> that um, for ourselves. Or for those of us who, who are not accessing a particular um, type of privilege, it could be that we've off, we've internalized sort of a narrative that we don't deserve the, those things. We don't deserve things to be different or that we can't change things, that, they're, that things are sort of static, right? And that's sort of like, you know, the kind of, the, the, the lie, I guess you could say, of, um, of all of those, those forces in our life, capitalism, white supremacy, ableism, you know, racism, is that it, it really is, is something that keeps you in the, in the static. It's, it's a story that has been told so many times that people start to really not just believe it, but invest in it and believe that nothing is possible without that one story, that, that single story, right? So for me, futurism is resistant, resistance work because it's, it's allowing ourselves to know that not only is a, is a future a different, um, a different future possible, but it's also possible for it to look nothing like this reality. Right? People have a really hard time, and again, here I'm not gonna I'm not gonna necessarily um, go into this into too much depth, but I do want to talk about some of the tangible ways in which we've really seen this year and last year people resisting the idea of a future that looks any different from this future, and we see this in conversations around um, transformative transformative justice. What does it look like to not have prisons, for example, right? Um, and, and also in terms of defund the conversation around defunding the police, what does it look like, not just to not have policing, but to really just not have that system exist? How are we going to keep our community safe? We are so, when we hear these concepts, they sound radical to us because we're not dwelling in the, in the realm of possibility. And it doesn't have to be those particular particular concepts. I'm not saying that if you don't believe in those things, it means you're not, you're not a dreamer, you're not thinking in terms of possibility, but I'm talking about on a wider scale. The reason why there's such a shock, there's such a visceral, without even having the conversation of visceral, just shut down of everything, is because we are, are we need to actually unlearn um, our stagnation around how we think about change. And, and social justice and how we think about ourselves in the future as well. Um, so I write a lot about these things. I have a piece called Gardens and Galaxies where I sort of talk about um, you know, gardens and galaxies in conversation with each other and, and talking about like the future of this. Anyway, I, I won't get into the narrative of that. It's a little bit complex, but it's really about kind of drawing from the things that we know, the things that we see, and how can we extrapolate that to, to broaden our horizons, to be more expansive with the way that we think about ourselves in the world and the world itself. So I write a lot about things that I've actually never experienced or seen, um, but see the beauty in it. So things that are really majestic or grand, really aspirational imagery in my work, like the cosmos out of space or outer space. Um, and I think galactic imagery in particular um, is present in a lot of futurist work, especially futurist work from people of color, Afrofuturist work. Um, and the reason is because I can't remember who said it. I wouldn't say this is the only reason, but one, a couple of reasons that come to mind. I can't remember who said it. I wish I remembered her name. She is an uh, indigenous artist. I'm blanking on her name at the moment, but she said space is the only space that hasn't been colonized. And that really struck me. It's like, you know, we imagine ourselves in space as futurist artists because space is the only space that hasn't been colonized. It's, it's a sad thing to think of, but it's also a thing that makes me think that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting reason for us to dream ourselves there, for us to create these worlds um, within worlds that are not actually in our, our physical world. Um, so I think that that can de that's definitely something that that resonated with me as as why we see so much of that kind of galactic imagery. But another reason I think is also because, you know, 
it's beyond what we know was beyond what we know so there's so much more space for imagination there's so much more space to create worlds it's really just because we're so in our current kind of um understanding of what's around us we we tend to be so fixed that when we want to dream when we want to create new worlds when we think about world building we actually take ourselves out of earth <laughs> we take ourselves somewhere else which is which is really fascinating um, to me because I really want to ask in my work, both as an artist and as an organizer, how can we create that level of openness that we feel when we're thinking of space, right? For our imaginations here on earth, how can we engage in aspirational world building here? Um, and when I think of reimagining, I think of uh, Grace Lee Boggs, the activist and author who said, reimagine everything. Um, which is really what we're talking about here is possibility is reimagining everything, not just aspects of things, but everything. And even if something is, is feels abrasive or feels uncomfortable, maybe sitting with that discomfort is what, what we need to actually take us out of, uh, you know, the kind of hamster wheel we tend to be in where uh, we don't necessarily see the change in the world or we might see it and it's fleeting. It feels like a moment and then it's gone. We have a really... I think difficult time holding on to that momentum and that moment. Um, and, and it's because of the fear of, of really, really kind of delving into possibility. Um, another hero of mine, Audrey Lord, she has a she has an anthology of, of essays that I have called Sister Outsider. And in that she talks about, she has a chapter called uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury, which as a poet, I was like, interesting what do you mean <laughs> so uh, i want to share a quote from her because it also ties into what i'm saying here she says poetry is not a luxury it is a vital necessity of our existence it forms the quality of light within which we predict our hopes and dreams towards survival and change first made into language then into idea and then into more tangible action and i think her she's she's using poetry both literally and metaphorically here um, which is interesting. It's like poetry is becoming the metaphor. Um, but I think that's also an extension of any creative output in the world, any art form in the world is it's not it's not necessarily a luxury, um, but we can luxuriate in it. We can allow it to be a, a space of play, but it's also it's also a tool to be able to build. Um, and I think that we have a hard time thinking of joy and play as essential. So it might feel like, wait, what's happening? You just said it was joyful and playful and now you're telling me it's not a luxury. Well, is our joy and, and our play a luxury or is it essential to who we are? I think that's, that's what we really need to ask ourselves, right? In a world where we are consumed with productivity, it might feel like, like a luxury, but I believe that joy and play is essential. I believe that it's essential to dwell in, in the realm of possibility. Um, and it's essential to take back take back our stories in whatever way we want to take them back. Not always centered on our trauma, maybe centered on our trauma if we feel like we need that, um, but in whatever ways we want to take up space. So I wanted to kind of leave leave you with that, some real kind of example of, of how I'm doing all the things that I'm talking about um, and a way in which we can we can start to, to kind of reimagine what community could look like. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this space. And yeah, I can't wait to, to chat in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Timaj. So much to think about and so uplifting and positive and hopeful at the same time, really incredible. So we move to our third speaker now, Dr. Tammy Gaybar. Um, to give us her presentation and then we will come together for a little bit of questions and answers afterwards. Over to you, Tami. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, it's, it's such an honor to be here today and to be um, a voice amongst these wonderful voices that we've heard from. Uh, and today what I'll be sharing with you is a project that I started in 2015. I called it Beyond the Divide, A Century of Canadian Mosque Design. And the, the idea for the project, um, it's interesting, came from frustration. Uh, and so I'm a, a Muslim architect. Um, I was trained in architecture here in Canada, but I did my graduate work in Cairo, Egypt, 
I came back um, with my PhD in hand and uh, teaching and working in uh, Ontario, Canada, and, and you know, I was looking up information about Canadian mosques and couldn't find any. Um, and the more I dug, you know, I, I found like, you know, bits and pieces about Al Rashid and different mosques, but nothing comprehensive. And certainly nothing about the space for women in mosques, which was something I'd always struggled with. Uh, I wrote a successful grant to the government of Canada for the, from the social sciences and humanities granting body. And this allowed me to do um, this project, which really changed my life. Um, so uh, in the space of a few years, uh, the grant allowed me to travel to 53 cities in Canada, and I studied 90 mosques. I knew of about 160 to 170 mosques. So I was looking at a sample much larger than half of the mosques. My goal was to visit um, all the major mosques in every province and to make sure that I was visiting mosques from different sects of Islam. Um, and then to try to also cover, you know, the, the earliest extant mosque uh, or any really unusual mosques. Um, and it was, you know, this was one of the most amazing things in my life that I've ever done is being able to travel up to the Arctic Circle to Inuvik, um, to Iqaluit on Baffin Island, um, and go as far west as Victoria and as far east uh, as Newfoundland. And I used every mode of transportation. It was a great way to learn about my country. Uh, but in every visit, it wasn't just about uh, purely documenting the building. So I'm an architect uh, by training and education and practice. And so, you know, I go to the building and I approach it by documenting the architecture. I photograph the exterior and the interior. Um, I have two research assistants, um, Safira Lakani and Jessica Hanzelkova, and they helped me as I gathered all the um, architectural data, we created um, um, architectural um, floor plans for every single mosque we went to and color coded it. And from that, you know, incredible uh, data set, we were able to do a lot of analysis and I was able to identify a number of trends. And so obviously tonight, today, I can't talk about all 90 mosques that I went to. Uh, I can hint at some of, some of the trends that I identified, um, but I wanted to share with you some of the highlights of, of this project and then what the project encouraged me to do with respect to art and art creation. Uh, so the first place I went to officially with my research project was the Newark Cultural Centre. So I live in Sudbury, Ontario, and so that's about 450 kilometres north of Toronto. Um, I'm, I was always very interested with the Newark Cultural Centre. It was formerly a Japanese-Canadian cultural centre, and then the same architect, Raymond Moriyama, from Moriyama Tsushima Architects, was hired to reconfigure it in 2008 at the behest of the Lakani family, which purchased it, to turn it into this um, you know, a cultural center with a Muslim prayer space in it. Uh, the reason why I'm so attracted to it is this space right here. This is one of the few spaces I have experienced as a Muslim woman where I felt I was on par with anyone else. Here I could pray in the front row and I can listen to the khutbah. I can listen to the khutbah given by a woman in a beautiful space. And this was always transformative. The first time I experienced this, I remember I was sitting with my young daughter and she turned to me and she said, Mama, we're in the front row. And I was like, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, and it was really um, a very special experience for me. So I, I came back here to begin my study and um, the Newark Cultural Center has been a wonderful supporter of the project uh, as well. And you can see some of the details. I mean, the architect, when he was asked to redo this building and convert it into a, into a, a cultural center and a place of prayer, he was also asked to kind of keep the spirit of its kind of frugality of materials, uh, and there's lots I can talk about, you know, about the Japanese community and how they paid for out of pocket for this and the architect did this pro bono. There's all these wonderful stories that parallel our own community's stories. But here you can see the word Noor uh, in the trellis work. And then this is an example. So what I'll do when I show mosques, I'll show you the architectural floor plans that we created for them. Um, and I've just color coded it. So gray is the men's space and red is the women's. So right away you get a visual of, you know, is it equal? Um, you know, how are they oriented in relationship to each other? If there's no black line between them, it means there's no architectural separation, which was something I was uh, taking a note of during my project. I won't get a chance to talk too much about it, but I also noted on each plan the Qibla orientation. And I did a whole analysis of how is Qibla calculated in Canada and what does it mean? Uh, next, I went to Al Rashid. Um, incredible story, incredible mosque um, in Edmonton. And thanks to the wonderful women of the CCMW, it survives today for us to be able to see. Um, and, and I encourage you to learn more about the history of El Rashid Mosque, but it was a very important moment for me, my research to finally come here, see it, 
And I was fortunate enough to speak to a number of people who have memories of being and using the mosque when it was being used before it became part of the Fort Edmonton Park. Um, one of the anecdotes is I, I interviewed Judge Edward Saadi, who I think was six years old when the mosque opened in 1938. And he, he talked about, you know, growing up and eventually becoming the president of the mosque. And he talked about how the community prayed the way we see it right there. No architectural barriers. They shared the space. They loaned the space out to various members of non-Muslims in the community. And in fact, the mosque was paid for um, during the Great Depression by members of all members of the community of different faith backgrounds. So I, I really love this mosque um, because of the story it tells. And we've today we've been talking about stories. And to me, the story it tells is about community overcoming its differences and creating something for them to gather in and share. Um, to me, that's more important um, as an architect than the kind of what's usually placed emphasis on, which is the way a building looks like. And if it reminds you of this or if it borrows this, it's the stories of the communities, right, that um, touch me deeply that I learned about as I traveled from each mosque to each mosque. And you can see here that anecdotally, you know, from Edward and others, I learned that um, that uh, people prayed in the mosque, Muslims prayed in the mosque without an architectural barrier, just by social convention, arranging themselves. Um, and he said that later on, um, as the community grew, these ideas came of, oh no, we need to separate, we need to barricade, they can't see, and so forth. Uh, and then I went as far north as Inuvik. So this is above the Arctic Circle. This was incredible. I think it took five different flights to get here. Um, and this was a, a, an extraordinary experience to be in this mosque and to meet the community. There's about a hundred Muslims living in Inuvik. And in fact, it's so cold there, you couldn't build the mosque there. This was built in Winnipeg and placed on the back of a truck, um, trucked for 4,500 kilometers. Um, and there's a home movie dedicated uh, to that story. Uh, and it's just, it, it was incredible to go there uh, and meet the Muslims and see what impact the mosque has on their lives and what more is given back to the community uh, here's the interior space. And just quickly by referring to the plan, there's that kind of bar building at the bottom. So that was added later on, and that's a food bank created by the Muslim community there, uh, supported by the charitable donations of Muslims across Canada. And that food bank really supports a bigger part of the community far beyond the Muslim community. So to kind of speak about the kind of give and take and the you know, what a mosque can do is much more than what it simply looks like, right? Uh, but also if we look at the plan, we'll note um, that here, the red zone is separated by walls and a window. So it is clearly a space that's smaller and separated. So, you know, during my project, all I did as best as I could is I documented what I saw. I interviewed architects, I interviewed people who used the mosque or governed in the mosque, and I collected all the stories. And it was only at the end I started to identify the patterns. Um, uh, it also gave me a chance to uh, spend time with members of my family in different parts of Canada. So I have family in Vancouver, and I spent a few weeks there. And then from Vancouver, I traveled up to Prince George. Um, and I got to see a number of mosques that uh, architecture symbol of Sembel Studio has designed in the province and beyond Canada. And Nadia talked about some of Shreve's uh, wonderful artwork that she uh, curated as well. I was so excited when I saw him, like, oh, I know him. <laughs> um, so he he designed this mosque and, and the story of how he got into mosque design is also really, it speaks to someone who was advocating for creating uh, Muslim spaces that were not relying on borrowing um, idioms or forms from history uh, because there's so much laden um, problems with that when you when you quickly just cut and paste or you borrow from different cultures or places because it starts to create um, uh, kind of a hierarchy or uh, a barrier for people to engage. Uh, and he was really interested in creating spaces that were Canadian mosque spaces that were of the place for the place for the people. And in each mosque he really collaborated with local artisans and local trades and emphasized what was important about the region. So here in Prince George, uh, timber reliant industry we, uh, city, we see a lot of timber being used. He also uses, you know, colored corrugated metal, which is popular there. Um, but I'll show you a few more images of this space because it really struck me. Um, and uh, the love and care with its design um, reflected in the love and care of the people taking care of the building as well and their pride in telling me the stories of the building. So as we uh, enter the building, 
this moment is, you know, kind of really blew me away because in a lot of the mosques I'd been to in my life and studied, the mihrab is a place is probably, you know, maybe the only place that's really decorated with patterns that are supposed to remind you of paradise. And, you know, you're orienting there towards Mecca to pray, to, you know, aspire towards paradise. And here, instead of decorating it, he just opens it wide up transparently and uh, takes advantage of the landscaping. And when you're praying, you're contemplating God's nature and that nature is Canadian. And to me, this was like a really, really powerful moment because when you study the history of Islamic architecture, you find that even though patterns were used, the types of flowers used in each region depended on the region, right? So in Egypt, it's the lotus. Uh, in Iran, you'd see the pomegranate, et cetera, et cetera. And here we see these beautiful trees. Um, and so this was a powerful moment for me uh, at this mosque. And again, here we see the women are in a balcony, but Sharif was very keen on creating spaces that felt uh, very uh, accessible. And so always the balcony ha is glass railing so that women can see right through it, uh, right into the main space. Um, in Burnaby, which is pretty close to Vancouver, um, I had the wonderful opportunity of visiting the Ismaili Center. Um, and I visited a number of Ismaili centers throughout Canada as well. This one really struck me because it's one of the few spaces for Muslims that I've seen in the contemporary world that pays as much attention to the landscape as it does the building. So when I look at drawings of the entire site, I see as much attention paid and there's a beautiful relationship in the organization of the landscape to the building. That's something that often gets dropped or lost when trying to kind of build up or make a space. So this was really powerful. And, you know, historically in Islamic societies, landscapes and garden, cultivated gardens, you know, expressed sustenance and life and joy. And um, I think was very also a part of faith. So uh, this was very special to see. This is the multi-purpose um, activity room or community room at the Ismaili Center. And here are the architectural plans for it. Um, nearby, actually very close to the Ismaili Center is um, the Al Salam Mosque, also designed by Sharif Sembel of Sembel Studio. So I won't speak too much about it, but I did want to show you a few of these. And here the regional take was to look at regional brick and wood on the interior. Now the brick, if you look closely, he starts using the, you know, the locally made brick and it's, um, the calligraphy is arranged to read um, in Arabic, the word Allah repeated over and over again. Uh, and then on the interior, we see the timber or the wood being used in a very special way called glue laminated or glue lamb, which means you take lots of pieces of wood together, glue them, compress them, they become very strong. And it means they can span a huge area. And he's used the pattern of the structure to emulate an Islamic eight point star pattern. And then in there are the skylights. So really a beautiful play on light, structure, local materials. And again, the transparent mihrab. Uh, it, you know, designed differently, but with the same spirit. And he's integrated into it also the minbar right in there. And then the architectural plans for Burnaby start to tell us of a pattern I started to notice across the country um, was that these mosques weren't just places of prayer. For the Muslim diaspora in Canada or for the Muslim community that's slowly growing over the past century, the mosque serves, you know, a purpose, purposes far beyond worship um, and religious gathering, but become places for education, for social um, funeral preparation as the mus as Muslim communities are um, uh, reconciling themselves with the reality that this is not a temporary space. They've come here for, for life and for death, right? Um, and so places for funeral preparation. Um, and then recently with um, the number of refu Muslim refugees coming to Canada, the mosques have been the hub for the refugees to transition into um, into their communities and the mosques have even expanded programming not just by having shifts for Friday prayers but also for you know also not just having Arabic lessons but also English lessons and places for um, uh, hubs for connection and finding opportunities for living and work um, and also a food bank and uh, other charitable uh, endeavors. And so what we see here in the floor plans isn't just a mosque, but we start to see a complex that's being used every day of the week. Uh, and then I went as far east as the, um, the Maritimes. That was wonderful. I drove that. I actually drove 7,000 kilometers. I drove all through the Maritimes as far as Newfoundland. I'm only going to show you one maritime mosque today, but there were many wonderful ones. Um, this one is in PEI. So in Prince Edward Island, there's only one mosque. 
and uh, it is the product of so much love and labor from the community, the Muslim community. So they fundraised for many years to be able to do this. They even got, um, they built it entirely of materials from uh, local hardware stores, and they were able to, you know, kind of set up this wonderful collaboration with the local hardware stores to have the materials uh, reduced in price or sold to them at cost. And they volunteered a lot of the labor themselves to keep the costs down. So you can see that this is really a product of the community. Um, and Masjid Dar es Salaam in PEI also functions in that multi-purpose way. So it's a lot smaller, but it serves every day in different ways uh, for the community. Uh, it was also heartening to see it being used uh, without architectural separation between men and women, and that it really was born out of the spirit of um, a really kind of inclusive community there. And uh, there you can see the plan. Um, and this mosque in Montreal, so I, I drove through uh, Quebec and went to a number of cities and visited a number of mosques in Quebec. And I noticed um, more than in any other province in Canada that the mosques tended to be in converted spaces instead of purpose-built. So in a converted space, um, sometimes the Muslim community would just purchase it for, you know, um, expediency because it's, you know, cost effective and not modify too much of it and just, you know, clean it out and use it, which is, you know, totally fine and has done quite a bit. Uh, but in some cases like this one, the Muslim community would invest quite a bit of money to change the way it looked on the inside and the outside. And so looking at this, um, you know, I, I can tell you by looking at it that this, and I found out later when I researched that this is, this used to be an auto repair shop. And you can tell that by the kind of proportion and the structural members used on the outside. But the community really focused on um, adding to the materials and changing it. And then here you can see the minarets been added on the interior, uh, Moroccan work uh, craftspeople uh, came and worked on the interior and inserted the skylight with all this beautiful woodwork, really transforming the uh, interior and the experience of the interior. And there you can see in the plan. So sometimes, you know, in the plans, I, you know, noticed a disproportionate amount of space allocation between men and women. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it was, you know, separated, like I said, and I can't, uh, I could not say that one type of architectural separation is worse than another or better than another. But what I started to do was really focus on the experience from the women's space into the men's. And this is where I was relying on my own agency as a practicing Muslim woman. When I used, I, you know, I'd analyzed the space as, a, as an architect. Um, and there were a few moments where in some mosques, um, I was told very abruptly <laughs> and loudly by men uh, that I wasn't allowed in the men's space. And then, you know, I produced the documents that I was, you know, a professor, an architect, and I was doing this project and it would instantly neutralize me because I was an academic. And then I was allowed access to all parts of the mosque that normally I wouldn't be as a Muslim woman. But then after that, I would go into the Muslim space, Muslim woman's space, which again, wouldn't be something that anyone could gain access to if they weren't uh, a woman. And I would see often the disconnect. And, and sometimes the disconnect was really, you know, this is something I've lived with my whole life, but doing this project really emphasized the disconnect between some of the main spaces I would go in and the resultant view from the women's space. So I started categorizing women's spaces as no view, some view, and view. And within that, I could start to parse out what the architectural elements meant, decisions with respect to ceiling height, barrier windows, etc. So, I mean, the whole project, <laughs> it's a labor of love, <laughs> but finally it's, um, it's been, you know, all put together, all of the study of the 90 mosques, that is some of the trends I've talked about today, I've identified. Um, and all of the architectural drawings and photographs uh, are going to be available for pre-order from McGill Queens Press uh, in May. So I'm really excited that I get to share with you this cover uh, that the publisher just shared with me last week. Um, and it's actually uh, right here in North York at the Ismaili Center. Um, and, and I have a bit of time to talk to you about uh, the other project that I did. Um, and so, as I said, when I was doing the research project, often I felt really, you know, I was trying to be unbiased and trying to document all of the material before I made conclusions, but I often found myself really, really feeling frustrated um, with the women's spaces. And so what eventually became called room sometimes with a view um, are these artworks that I created for myself. They, these were only created for myself and that was the only intention is I had to have an outlet. 
and just kind of quickly walk you through this is it would begin um, with these sketchbooks where I'd uh, glue in photographs I'd taken of each space. Um, and I'd, you know, do some sketches and write some notes and just kind of start to kind of vent a little bit about how I was feeling, the kind of stuff I wouldn't write in an academic text. <laughs> um, and from these sketches, I kept trying to kind of capture what it felt like to be there. Um, and, you know, capturing what it felt like to be there is really hard when you're just looking at these kind of almost sterile, empty photographs, right? And so I went back to something I used to do as, an, as a student and as a designer, is I started using multimedia uh, to just quickly sketch out something. But here I was really doing it um, methodically. And so I would begin, so this is all on uh, three quarter inch plywood. Um, I would begin first by painting accurately the perspective of the space that could be viewed had there not been a barrier for women. Uh, and then I layer onto it the floor because the floor is political, the floor is charred charged, right? In some mosques, I have access to the floor. In some mosques, I don't, right? And for me, for the floor, if everything else can be rendered in neutral tones, the floor would be rendered in red, the color of blood, the color of creation, the color of life. And at hand, what I had to collage it with were fashion magazines. So I was using, in a way, I was kind of, you know, really empowering my, my own personal narrative as I was doing this for myself, is by using, you know, pieces of, um, uh, women's kind of expression to kind of weave together this collaged carpet. And then I would layer onto it, you know, what view was remaining for the women. And in some cases, the view was transparent, as we can see in these two mosques. And in some cases, the view was completely, you know, non-existent. After I'd painted the view, it was gone after I'd layered everything on. And for me, it was about the process and the final piece. And here, you know, I'm, I'm in a narrow space in the corner separated from the main space by a wall that's with windows that are covered with mirror stickers. So all I see is myself. Really very isolating experience. Uh, and here I have a peekaboo view of some of the main space. And then this one really struck me when I went to this space. The women's space was separated by a level, by a railing and by several windows. And you know, and I, by several, sorry, curtains. And I just was like, all the layers that seem to be imposed on an architectural level were really separating and isolating uh, the experience of women who are coming to the mosque as a place to gather. I mean, it's also dis very jarring, right? To have access to every other space in society, but in the space that you're supposed to have community, you don't. And so to me, this was really jarring. So I did these pieces and um, in October of 2017, the Canadian Council of Muslim Women um, and I spoke and we decided that we would, um, you know, uh, create, you know, I'd be a part of the event that they were creating in October by showcasing some of the research for the project. I went down in February to talk to them about it and show them some of the photographs I'd taken and the architectural drawings. And I, as I went to my office to pack up the stuff, my, my daughter was with me and she's like, mom, take your artwork with you. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> that's for me. She's like, no, no, just, just take it with you. And so I took three or four pieces, just kind of like almost embarrassed because I saw in them something that maybe I, I did them for myself. And so I took them down and I'll, I'll never forget when I walked into the room and, and Nuzhat, you were there and Nina, you were there and, and Alia and, and the reaction you guys had uh, shocked me that you could you know, see what I was seeing without me having to explain anything. Um, and they really encouraged me to finish the project. So um, I finished, I, when I say finished, I don't know if anyone's ever finished, but <laughs> I did a number of the collage pieces and finished the research. And in October at the Newark Cultural Center, we exhibited all of the work. Um, and then we had an incredible symposium. And I was really honored that uh, Zarka Nawaz came um, and moderated a wonderful discussion uh, along with Naveen Rida from the University of Toronto and Sahala Khan Salter. And so it was just, you know, a really special moment to be able to talk about the subject um, and share it with such uh, esteemed members of our community and to hear feedback too. So it was really special. Uh, this is an image of um, at the Newark Cultural Center. So it's a, it's a nice full circle moment um, for this milestone, you know, it, for me, the project began here. It didn't end here, but this was a milestone moment for me um, to exhibit the pieces. And you can see the the pieces I designed. Um, I designed and built these these walls, custom made to match the architecture of the building. That's that's how much respect and love I have for this space. Um, 
because I didn't want to kind of impose on it uh, too much. But that's that's just a, a bit of some of the work I've done. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tami. That was an incredible presentation. And what I really, really love about all your contributions today is the fact that it really shows, first of all, the diversity of uh, Muslim experience and Muslim female experience in Canada. Um, it shows a deep, deep commitment to the land, to the peoples, to the experiences of yourself and others in dialogue across um, Canada and really um, an interconnectedness between yourselves as individual and individuals and Muslim women and this country in which you are active, in which you are dedicated to making um, your voices heard, but also making contributions that go well beyond your um, immediate faith community and the immediate uh, communities you belong to. Um, so I think there was so much phenomenal food for thought in here. And um, I would be really, really interested to um, ask a little bit about how in the wake of COVID and in the wake of this unprecedented crisis, your work has actually evolved and has made you think about certain um, aspects of very work in, in different ways, not in terms of challenges, but in terms of opportunity and in terms of priority. So um, perhaps I could start with you, Nadia. How do you see that? How has the uh, pandemic changed your, your approach and your vision for the future? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly shifting everything online has been a big challenge, but again, it's a, a part of, I think, um, the opportunity as well. And so one thing that it's really made me think about is, um, of course, collections and the artwork and um, making that work more accessible to audiences and to students in particular online. I think um, it's always been a back burner issue um, for us uh, and uh, working in collections, that's always the, the goal I think is to digitize, digitize a lot of our art. Um, but often it gets put in the back burner and the, the pandemic has really shown that um, it, it actually needs to be prioritized. And it's also made us think a lot more about issues of accessibility online and how we can tell those stories um, in a way that, you know, it's not just simply the online exhibition, but to get creative with uh, using um, artwork and to showcase that. So that's been, um, you know, something that I've been thinking a lot about is, again, how to tell those stories um, in a different format that can reach broader audiences. Yeah, that's such an important point because we at the museum always also look at how we can unlock many voices around an object because traditionally the voices around an object are very very limited because it tended to be the curator who speaks and the viewer who listens but nowadays of course we know um, and we celebrate the fact that there are many many voices that uh, can be heard should be heard um, including the voice of the object itself, to be honest, you know, and um, this is also a wonderful topic that Timaj was talking about, the importance of telling stories. And Timaj, I was really um, inspired by your positivity and by your um, commitment to telling stories through playfulness and through joyous expression, while still, of course, addressing all the critical points. So in, in your particular um, uh, experience, how has the crisis opened up new opportunities, new stories, new ways of delivering your, your art at your end? Yeah, so um, it's, been, it's been challenging to, um, to perform on, on a virtual space. A lot of kind of technical challenges when you are a performance artist, specifically with music, 
Um, and it's just, you know, it, it's, it's a different space that you occupy and have to think about engagement in a different way as well because of that. Um, I think that, you know, to Nadia's point, it's, there are challenges with access, but then it's also in, in a way created greater access um, to more audiences. So it's funny, I've been, I always joke and say like, you know, last year I went to like the UK and I went to the Bahamas and I went all over the States, but I was in my room, like, you know, <laughs> all these shows that were like international shows all of a sudden were like, now that we don't have to pay for your flight and hotel, we can, <laughs> we can afford to have you at our event. Um, but in all seriousness, I, I, I think there's a beauty in, in being able to stay connected in that way. But, you know, there, I also feel very much like the stage is is kind of my my performance home like a, a physical stage and I very much miss it um it hasn't really changed how I perform I I think I, I try to imagine myself I have a pretty good imagination so I'm able to do that effectively but it's definitely uh it's there's definitely kind of a, a nostalgia around like you know performing and being able to see a crowd and engage with a crowd and know what they're thinking and not thinking, but know how they're receiving it in some ways, like get their, their uh, response and reaction. Um, but I also want to say, you know, like, I think that the, the joyfulness and that kind of thing, like, I think performance for me, has been a space of, of joy um, because it's also a space of connection um, and it's not to dilute or take away from, from, you know, people's experiences of oppression. It's really just to, to say that we can, we can heal from that and create safe spaces. So, um, you know, I think for me, the word I use is hope, you know, the word I use is hope and resilience. So, um, so yeah, I feel, I, I think that I, I have a lot of that hope for being able to kind of return to the way that things, that things were to some extent, at least. Oh, well, you know, it's absolutely true. We all long for that human connection and the energy that we have when we are in a room together because you can only convey so much hope or love or connectedness uh, on, a, on a Zoom screen, right? But at the same time, also, it opens up a lot of new opportunities of conversation with people that we might not have been uh, able to speak to when we were still in the physical domain because we actually never thought of reaching out um, to colleagues uh, on the other side of the world. So that is always what keeps me going because when I sit in my little office and look at the wall, I think, oh my God, you know, I can speak to people and dream up uh, topics for conversation um, and give voice to people that, that would never have been possible before. So um, I think hopefully a lot of good new conversations and uh, empowerment of voices will come out of this crisis through the digital domain. Um, and Tammy, for you, what I really wanted to ask you because I loved your, uh, your presentation and it was so amazing in that it really showed um, not only the resilience and adaptability of Muslim communities, but also really their willingness and positivity when it comes to dialogue with um, their new realities, their new landscapes, their new um, fellow citizens in the places they find themselves. Um, and the, the positive interactions with other cultures. And now again, we've been so kept away from each other through the crisis and so hemmed in. Do you feel that that has had um, a negative uh, impact on how communities react to each other or interact with each other? Or do you actually feel that communities across you know, their different uh, faith uh, or spirituality have actually pulled together because of the crisis and have deepened their conversations? It's, it's a really good question. It's something I've been thinking about because you, you, you saw at the heart of my critique was the kind of separation of women in the mosque. And, um, and it just got me thinking that if people are, you know, praying in their homes now and celebrating, you know, potentially the second Ramadan at home, um, without the community and have gotten used to 
being in an equal space as the rest of their male members of their family, what is the mosque going to look like post COVID? Not just in terms of like, you know, social distancing or, or all of those measures, but in terms of accessibility. Like to me, I think it's an accessibility issue and it's contra everything I believe in as an architect when I design any other kind of building to think that I would limit a group of people simply because of a label, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm dreaming of a post COVID world where a lot of those walls are going to come down and that people are going to question them. And it's only gonna happen when communities question them and talk about it and know that it's possible and that great mosques exist. <laughs> you know, sometimes to imagine something, you have to know that it happened somewhere, <laughs> um, but to know that it exists. And I think having that personal experience of praying at home and appreciating community and really missing it. Like I really miss community. Like the, the thought of going to another Ramadan alone is just like, it's, it's hard. It's like, it's really hard. Like I'm thankful for technology that we have and that we're able to connect now and um, all over the world. But I really miss, I really miss community. And I pray for the day when we come back together that it's on more equitable terms. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a very important point. And I think we all share that longing for the inter interhuman connectivity. Again, we were at friend's house the other day and they had organized a Zoom call with all their cousins. Can you imagine how many cousins? You can imagine how many cousins. <laughs> and can. they were all on the screen, all... 50 cousins and you know when you have that in a room it's the most joyous wonderful thing you can have but when you have it on a screen it's kind of everybody talks over everybody and nobody <laughs> what are you saying and the connection is not good and I have to drop off and so the dynamics of community relations because of the crisis are no doubt adjusting and morphing and and another aspect that comes into it too is the intergenerational conversations and challenges because with people being uh, imprisoned in their houses and often with extended families, when we, when we look at, at Muslim communities in, in this particular context, there are all sorts of conversations that have not had to happen before, but now are really coming to a head because everyone is, um, is living so closely together. So um, a lot of wonderful, wonderful things to, um, keep us going with our thinking, but also I think a lot of opportunities to seize the crisis and um, imagine, as Timaj was saying, um, a post-COVID future that is more equitable, more um, open to new ideas, new ways of doing things and um, approaching life as we know it. Um, I would like to thank you because it really was a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation from the three of you. And I would love to um, uh, say that I hope we will do this again. Um, you will all be most welcome at the Aga Khan Museum uh, for follow-up events because I'm really inspired. For those who are watching, please uh, visit us um, on our website. And of course, our arms are open before our doors. When we reopen, we will <clears throat> give you a really warm welcome. Thank you for this opportunity <clears throat> to present with you today. And I pass it over to Nushat for our closing remarks. Uh, the CCMW is a not-for-profit organization that was founded almost 40 years ago. We mainly rely on government funding to do our important and groundbreaking, groundbreaking nationwide work. We're also a small team of dedicated and hardworking women. As many of you might know, the CCMW founded the Lila Fallman Scholarship Fund, named after our founder, the late Dr. Lila Fallman. May God have mercy on her soul. It awards scholarships to Canadian Muslim women who are enrolled in a full-time undergraduate or graduate degree or certificate program at a Canadian college or university. We can only do all of this with your support. Please consider donating to CCMW so we can continue to do this excellent and much needed work. I wanna kindly remind you that Sadaqa Jariya is an important concept within Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him said, 
When a person dies, all their deeds end except for three, a continuing charity, beneficial knowledge, and a child who prays for them. Therefore, Muslims are eager to give charity, which will continue to have benefits to people after their death and can you continue to earn them rewards. Any charity which continues to have positive effects on a community in the long term can be considered a sadiqajariya. It's a privilege to be in a position to offer charity and it's an honor to fulfill a divine obligation. May the Almighty make all of us his grateful servants who appreciate and acknowledge his blessings as well as the good that others in our lives do for us. Amen. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.